Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hertz. I'm the uh, Chief Marketing Officer here at White & Case uh, and want to welcome you to our offices. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I also co-founded Pro Bono Net along with Mark O'Brien, who is the Executive Director of Pro Bono Net, uh, and I'm still on the Board of Directors. When we started Pro Bono Net in 1999, I was a partner at Latham, uh, very involved in their pro bono activities, and Mark was uh, the full-time pro bono coordinator at Davis Polk, one of the first kind of full-time pro, pro bono coordinators at one of the big firms. And Mark and I, along with a few of our other kindred spirits, had a vision of using the new web technologies to increase access to justice. And as our name, Pro Bono Net, suggests, our thinking was originally very focused on linking pro bono lawyers uh, to each other and to the organizations that had uh, matters for volunteer lawyers and to resources and training for uh, the lawyers who were, uh, in many cases, inexperienced in the legal areas that they were getting involved in. So bringing together and supporting pro bono, legal aid, and other advocates is still a very important part of what we do. Uh, some of the kindred spirits that I wanted to mention are first the Open Society Institute, uh, George Soros's foundation, then under the leadership of Gara LaMarche and Catherine Samuels. They funded us for a number of years and incubated Pro Bono Net in their offices. And they have continued to support our work uh, over the years uh, and particularly in the last several years around the immigration area. Uh, Michael Mills, is Michael here yet? No? Okay, Michael Mills was there at the beginning. He's still on the board. Uh, he was also at Davis Polk and was then and is today, in my view, one of the most knowledgeable technology people in the legal sector. Michael Cooper, a uh, senior partner at Sullivan and our first board chair, took us under his wing when we were just getting started and lent his very significant credibility to our cause. And Michael's here in the front row and it's great to have you here. Uh, the Legal Services Corporation played a huge role in our national expansion, providing funding to their legal aid grantees to work with us. And I don't know if Elaine Barnett is here yet, uh, but she'll be joining us at some point today. And uh, she was the LSC president from 2004 to 2009, uh, and is still very active in the kind of access to justice uh, thinking and work in New York State. Um, we have been able, as an organization, uh, to attract incredibly talented and committed staff over the years, uh, they deserve a huge amount of credit uh, as well for their many for many of our achievements. Uh, and I just want to thank all of the staff um, uh, for their contributions. So two key aspects of our strategy were established in those early days. First, we decided to build a technology platform that all the groups could use and invest in. This seems really obvious today, but 20 years ago, it was not as obvious. Uh, and it was a relatively new concept, especially in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and we believe that this platform approach has yielded huge benefits for us and for the larger community that we work with. Um, and it does so by focusing many of our investments in technology around a common set of technologies. Uh, and this also allowed us to support a lot of work across the country and also to continue to innovate while doing so. Uh, second was it was very important to work in collaboration with the existing providers of services and empower them to reach more people in need and to help us set our priorities for the future. And that network of groups uh, now working closely together for many years is a tremendous asset for us and for the larger legal aid community. As you will hear this afternoon, our programs have expanded way beyond that early starting point in New York. Pro Bono Net is now a national organization and has been so for a number of years. It has over 30 employees, a $6 million a year budget. Our funding comes from a diverse range of sources, including grants, law firms, corporations, individual giving, and fees for service. And, uh, and we now reach annually millions of people with the information and services that we provide. Uh, as with many expanding technology companies, uh, we need money. Uh, our funding is needed to support continued growth uh, across uh, new areas and also to support investments in our technology, which of course is, as all of you know, changing very, very rapidly again. And I think we'll hear from Brad Smith from Microsoft about just how quickly things are changing. 
So I just want to thank everyone in the room today who supports us. And if you're not supporting us, uh, please think about doing so. Uh, and uh, we can talk to you at any time after the program about that. Uh, here's our uh, agenda for today. Uh, we're, we were, um, uh, when we were thinking about our 20th, we thought, uh, let's uh, bring thought leaders together and have, uh, you know, have a discussion. Um, uh, we've obviously been very associated with innovation as an organization. That's kind of at the core of what we do. And we wanted to use the anniversary uh, to bring new ideas into the room and provoke all of our thinking. Uh, we are thrilled today with the program of, of speakers and panelists. We're starting with a talk by uh, Harvind Gurma, who is here with us, um, who will be introduced by Liz Keith from Pro Bono Net in just a few minutes. We'll then have a second panel on uh, the area of um, the emerging area of uh, litigation funding and having a discussion around whether there are aspects of that which could bring more resources into the legal aid community and into public interest litigation. Um, that session will be led by Judge Scheinlin, a former Southern District of New York judge who's now at Strook. And finally, Brad Smith will join us a little bit later from Microsoft and will share his thoughts on technology and society. And Hugh Verrier, the chair of White and Case, will come and facilitate the Q&A. Uh, we'll try to have uh, opportunities throughout for Q&A after each of the sessions. Uh, and we may have a short break between sessions, depending on how uh, on time we're running. Um, but there are drinks in the back of the room, and we may keep moving pretty quickly between sessions. So don't wander too far between the sessions. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. We'll be photographing and video videotaping these sessions. Um, all of the speakers are happy with people posting live uh, during the event on social media. Uh, the hashtag uh, is on the slides, so if you could use the hashtag ProBonoNet20, uh, that would be great. Um, and if anyone requires the services of a sign language interpreter, Rick Rubin uh, is available, and just please indicate to Rick uh, that you want him to continue to interpret. Otherwise, uh, he will um, join the audience. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to welcome Liz up to the podium and to introduce Havan Girma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael and White and Case. I'm Liz Keith, I'm the program director with Pro Bono Net and am delighted to have all of you with us today and honored to have the opportunity to introduce Haben. I had a chance to meet Haben in person last week in the San Francisco Bay Area where we both live. And I wanted to briefly say a few words about Pro Bono Net's mission and how I think that relates to what I've learned about Haben and her work. At Pro Bono Net, we believe that justice is a fundamental human value and right, and that people have the right for their voice to be heard, to know and exercise their rights, and to challenge inequity and discrimination. We also think that the law and our justice system should be relevant, accessible, and usable by everyone, regardless of how much money they have, where they live, or whether they have access to a lawyer. And as Michael mentioned, while our programs have evolved over the two decades that we've been working in this space, our work continues to be centered on and grounded in developing and scaling digital tools that help to realize those vision and values through a few different strategies. One is we help and ordinary people, particularly those living on the economic margins, understand their legal issues and what their options are. We also develop tools to help empower people to navigate complex processes and that make those processes more people-centered and sensitive to the needs of individuals who are facing life-altering legal situations. We also develop and work to strengthen the efforts of legal aid advocates and pro bono lawyers who are advocating for people whose home or family or safety or livelihood is at stake. And we have a variety of strategies to help reduce barriers to justice that are caused by geography or language or fear or isolation that um, might prevent people from seeking help in the first place or even feeling like a positive res resolution to their problem is possible. 
So um, as Michael said, we're a small but, but mighty organization, um, but I think we've been able to have an outsized and enduring impact because of the insights that Michael and Mark, our executive director, and our board and staff continue to have to build programs and platforms that can be scaled from places like here in New York to 40 states today, but that also could help public interest legal organizations collaborate network and invest in new ways to solve common problems, not individually, but as communities. So it's um, been an honor to be a part of this organization and the journey of this organization and the community uh, doing this work that's helped millions of people over two decades and also been a catalyst for innovation in the civil justice sector. And I'm really excited about the amazing lineup of speakers that we have here today and ways I think they will spark new ideas to help shape and inform our collective work in the years ahead. I hope in particular that hearing Hobbin's story and perspective on how people with disabilities drive innovation will expand and challenge our imagination and our determination about what each of us can do to make our own communities as well as our justice system more accessible, equitable, and inclusive for everyone. Hobbin is the first deaf-blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School and an advocate for equal opportunities for people with disabilities. President Obama named her a White House Champion of Change. She received the Helen Keller Achievement Award and a spot on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list. President Bill Clinton, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and Chancellor Angela Merkel have all honored Hobbin. Hobbin believes disability is an opportunity for innovation. She travels the world teaching the benefits of choosing inclusion. Her best-selling memoir, recently released, is called Hobbin, the Deafblind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law. And it's been featured in the New York Times, Oprah Magazine, People, The Wall Street Journal, The Today Show, and more. So with that, uh, thank you, and please give a warm welcome to Hobbin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for welcoming me here. Can we get a round of applause for Wade and Case and Pro Bono Net for bringing us all together today? As you heard, I'm deaf blind. I have limited vision and hearing. Connecting with people is really important to me. There's a lot of diversity in the deaf blind community, and we use all different kinds of communication tools. Some people use sign language. Some use print on palm, some use finger spelling, some use voice, and some use text. I'm using Braille. I'm holding up a device, technology, that uses Braille on the bottom. I run my fingers over the dots to feel the letters. It's connected to a wireless keyboard, and Cameron is typing on the keyboard visual and audio descriptions so I can stay connected with the audience. So when people applaud, when people laugh, when people fall asleep, <laughs> I wanted to give you a heads up that during this presentation, she'll be watching you. <laughs> there are all these alternative techniques and when we're thoughtful and creative, we can find those solutions. My name is Haben. The name Haben comes from Eritrea. It's a small African country. Ethiopia borders to the south, and to the north is the Red Sea. My mother grew up during the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. There was a lot of violence, a lot of fear. Schools are places for students to come together and hear stories from around the world. Stories are powerful. Stories influence the organizations we design, the products we build, and the futures we imagine for ourselves. My mother heard stories that America is the land of opportunity, America is the land of civil rights, and the stories inspired her to take the dangerous journey, walking from Eritrea to Sudan. She was a refugee for about 10 months in Sudan. Then a refugee organization helped her come to the United States. Several years later, 
older, wiser, my mother realized it's not geography that creates justice. It's people that create justice. Communities create justice. All of us face the choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. As the daughter of refugees, a black woman, disabled, lots of stories say my life doesn't matter. I choose to resist those stories. The dominant story is that people with disabilities are a burden on society and have nothing to contribute. That's ableism. I resist the story. I define disability as an opportunity for innovation. If you can't do something one way, come up with another way so that we can access information, access legal services, and we can build the justice based on our community. People with disabilities have been developing solutions all throughout history. These are hidden stories, so very few people know about them. If we can get these stories out there and educate the communities, then we can shift the dominant story from one of pity to one of talent and innovation. I'll give examples. Next slide. We have a slide where a young man is signing. I'm holding my hands over his hands and feeling his signs. This is tactile sign language. Deaf communities all over the world have been developing sign languages. The dominant one in the US is American Sign Language. In France, it's French Sign Language. Across the pond in the UK, they have a completely different language and it makes no sense to me. <laughs> they call it British Sign Language. If you can't hear language, you can create a visual language. If you can't hear or see language, you can create a tactile language. And deaf-blind communities have done that, developing tactile sign language and pro-tactile. We are dynamic. Disability is part of the human experience, and there's always an alternative solution. Technology is a very powerful tool that creates even more opportunities to share information and create access. Next slide. Another form of communication is dance. When I was growing up, I was taken out of a lot of physical education programs because people assumed I wouldn't be able to participate. Then I went to a camp where there was a salsa class with a blind salsa instructor. I was surprised but I decided to learn, and I discovered that we communicate music through our hands and shoulders, and even if I can't hear the beat, I can feel the beat through the people I dance with. And in the video, there's salsa dancing. We all find many different ways to connect, and one way to access information about our world and connect with people is through dance. The dominant story is no access for people with disabilities. It takes affirmative steps to remove barriers so we can create access for people with disabilities. I've been very successful in my life because I've had people take affirmative steps to remove barriers. One person was a high school teacher. She came to me one day and asked, would you like to try surfing? I thought to myself, how would a blind person surf? But I said, sure, let's give it a try. So we had a lesson. Next slide. We did tandem surfing. And on tandem surfing, it's a large board, water guide in the back, rider in front. I'm riding a wave on a surfboard here. And the water guide helps steer around other surfers and sharks. <laughs> I loved the ability to connect and access the ocean and experience the sport that has been denied to a lot of people. I started asking myself, what else can I do? Can I take lessons? I reached out to surf schools 
in California, and they told me we've never heard of a deafblind surfer. Then I found a school that said, we've never heard of a deafblind surfer, but let's try, let's find a way. So we had a lesson. Next slide. And in this lesson, we surfed side by side on our own boards. That gave me the opportunity to practice standing up, balancing as I rode the wave. And the instructor beside me was able to help steer around other surfers and sharks. <laughs> Anything can be made accessible. There are people in our community that we don't even try to include in our efforts to increase access because we make assumptions about what people can and can't do. Let's strive to make everything accessible. All programs, all our tech services, legal services, even the surfing programs should be made accessible to everyone. I was not always an advocate. Becoming an advocate is a journey. And at first, I told myself to just tolerate the unfairness. Maybe it's just part of the experience of being disabled. I went to college at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. They did a fantastic job providing me access to my course materials. Textbooks were in Braille. Exams were in Braille. There was just one problem. The cafeteria served as a central place for students to hang out, relax between classes. When you enter the cafeteria, there's a print menu. Sighted students could read the print menu. I couldn't read it, not because of blindness. Blindness is not the barrier. Disability is never the barrier. The barrier was the format of the menu. So I went to the manager and asked, can you provide the menu in Braille? or post it online or email it to me. I have assistive technology that allows me to access websites and email. The manager said, we're very busy. We have over a thousand students. We don't have time to assist you. Back then, I was a vegetarian. It's really hard to eat vegetarian if you don't know what the food choices are. There were about six different food stations I'd go to one at random, get food, find a table, try the food, and discover an unpleasant surprise. <laughs> it was really frustrating. But I told myself, at least I have food. My mother, when she was my age, was a refugee in Sudan. At least I was getting an education in the United States. Sometimes we engage in the oppression Olympics. We compare our struggles and shut down any desire to remove barriers by telling ourselves to just be grateful and tolerate oppression. That's not helpful. When we remove barriers, we're not just benefiting ourselves, we benefit all the other people who come after us. After talking to advocates, talking to friends, I finally decided to do something and change the situation. I went back to the cafeteria manager and I told him, the Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against students with disabilities. And if you don't provide access to the menus, I'm gonna take legal action. I had no idea how to do that. I was 19, I couldn't afford a lawyer. Now I know that there are legal centers that'll help students with disabilities. But back then, I didn't know that. All I knew is that I had to try. I had to do something. The next day, the manager apologized and promised to make the menus accessible. He did. Life became delicious. <laughs> the next year, a new blind student came to the college, and he had immediate access to the menus. That taught me when I advocate, I remove barriers for myself and all the others who come after me. It created a desire to become an attorney and remove barriers for more people throughout our world. I entered Harvard Law in 2010. 
Harvard told me we've never had a deafblind student before. I told Harvard I've never been to Harvard Law School before. <laughs> we didn't know what all the solutions would be, but we were committed to try, figure it out. If one thing didn't work, try a new accommodation. It's an interactive process to reach solutions. A little history about Harvard. Helen Keller was an amazing deaf-blind woman. She really wanted to go to Harvard, but back then, Harvard only admitted men. Helen's disability didn't hold her back. Her gender didn't hold her back. It was the community at Harvard that excluded women. Over time, the community changed. Harvard got a little smarter and finally opened its doors to women, people of color, and people with disabilities. Disability isn't the barrier. It's society that creates barriers. And it's up to all of us to accept oppression or advocate for justice to remove all those barriers. Next slide. We have a photo from graduation. Dean Minow is handing me my diploma. Dean Minow and I are wearing academic regalia and my guide dog is wearing a fancy fur coat. <laughs> what I did is called image description. Image description provides access to blind individuals. When you post photos online, websites, social media, include image descriptions so you connect with blind individuals and reach more people. A little background, the dog in the photo is not the same dog who's on stage with me. The dog in the photo is Maxine. She's a wonderful, brilliant seeing eye dog who worked with me for about nine years. And last year, she passed away due to cancer. It was extremely difficult to lose someone who was such an important part of my life and stood by me through all the important moments from going to Harvard to visiting the White House. It takes time to build a relationship. I spent three weeks training at the Seeing Eye in Morristown, New Jersey, and I partnered with this new dog, Milo. Just like human relationships, to have a good relationship with a guide dog, you need to invest time and emotion to develop communication so that you understand each other. Milo has been with me for about a year now. We travel all over the United States and outside the US in countries that have civil rights protections for guide dogs. So I've taken him to Europe, but I did not take him to China when I visited earlier uh, two weeks ago. Next slide. Sometimes you encounter stubborn institutions that refuse to create access for people with disabilities. On screen are arguments you can use to convince them to choose inclusion. One is you reach more people. There are over 60 million Americans with disabilities and over a billion people with disabilities around the world. That's a huge market. So businesses grow and increase their revenue when they make their services inclusive and reach this larger audience. Another argument you can use is content discoverability. When you add image descriptions to photos, captions to videos, transcripts for podcasts, you help with search engine optimization, more text is associated with your content, which makes it easier for non-disabled and disabled people to find your content. Another argument is innovation. People with disabilities drive innovation. I'll give an example from our history. Before the internet existed as we know it today, deaf individuals struggled to communicate long distance. We did not have access to the telephone. Vince Cerf, it's deaf, hard of hearing. He developed the earliest email protocol. Through email, 
Deaf people can communicate long distance without straining to hear over the phone. Hearing people also use email. <laughs> Lots of people use email. If you design for a disability challenge, you end up building the next big thing that benefits lots of people. There are many stories like this throughout our history. Design for access and inclusion, and you drive innovation. So these are arguments you can use, and if the stubborn person is still not convinced, tell them about legal requirements. <laughs> The ADA prohibits discrimination, and that includes digital services too. We've had cases, including one I worked on, National Federation of the Blind versus Script, where courts have said the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to digital services as well. Choose inclusion. I'm gonna share a short video that shows an example of an app that's designed with access in mind. Next slide. So when I'm using my phone, I use VoiceOver. VoiceOver can speak out loud and send information to the digital braille display. News. Checking for new news. National Geographic, unread. World's largest rodents on lamb from Toronto Zoo. I'm panning right on the braille display using the advanced forward button. If I wanted to instead use hand gestures on the iPhone, I could flick right with one finger. To open an item, I can double tap anywhere on the screen. Text size, caption, title, we title, world's large title. After escaping from the High Park Zoo in Canada, two capybaras have eluded capture for by Jason Biddle. Published June 9, most people do their best to avoid rodents of unusual size. But after a pair of capybaras escaped from Toronto's High Park Zoo on May 12th, alert. Gordon. Hi, I'm at the door sushi. Pot of food. Fish cake with swirl design. <laughs> My friend's at the door, so I'm just gonna let him know. Close. Button. Reply. Button. Messages notification. Hang. In. There. I'm. Almost. Done. With. This. Demo. Send. Button. VoiceOver has allowed me to access more information, news, mail, and messages. And it's also a way for me to know when friends are at the door. So that's an example of an app designed with access in mind. When you program apps, web services, for accessibility, then blind individuals can also access it. Notice I'm not saying a separate app or service for people with disabilities. Separate is never equal. You might start out with good intentions, but down the line, the app for disabled people gets updated less, has fewer features. So instead, we want one service that everyone can use. And there are guidelines to teach developers how to make technology accessible. For websites, it's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. For apps, there's Android, Apple, and Microsoft has accessibility guidelines. So tell your developers, design with access in mind so you reach more customers and grow and drive revenue. Next slide. Accessibility features, screen readers. You just heard about that. The voice that was speaking was a screen reader. Captions, the video also had captions. Captions benefit deaf individuals. They also benefit hearing individuals. A study by Facebook found that videos with captions have an increased average view time by about 12%. So in terms of marketing, you reach more people when, you're cap when your videos have captions. Support for assistive devices, like braille displays, like the one I have, and other assistive devices that people with disabilities use. These are the things that exist. Keep innovating. Keep thinking about all the different ways we can share information and connect with more people. 
don't make assumptions about what people with disabilities can and can't do, because we'll surprise you. When I went to China for the first time, it was a long flight from San Francisco, so I went straight to my hotel room. And there I discovered something strange. I was holding it in my hand, trying to figure out what it was. It almost felt like a piece of fruit. I asked myself, hmm, should I taste it? I was really curious to figure out what it was, but not curious enough to bite into an unknown object. <laughs> so instead, I took a picture with my phone and texted it to a friend asking, what is this? Is it safe to eat? Next slide. It was dragon fruit, and I learned I love dragon fruit. Some people would think, don't bother making a camera app accessible. Blind people would never use cameras. But we do. We take photos. We use legal services. So design with access in mind for all services, even if you've never heard of someone with a disability engaging in that specific activity. Next slide. Share these messages with your communities. We need all of you to be advocates and design with access in mind and encourage all things to be accessible. Next slide. We have a photo with President Obama standing at a table. I met him at the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm on the other side of the table reading from the Braille computer. President Obama usually communicates by voice. He graciously switched from voicing to typing so I could access his words. Inclusion is a choice. All of us have the choice to remove barriers. And when we do so, we role model inclusion for everyone else in our community. Next slide. We will move on to Q&A. For Q&A, I'm going to invite you to ask your questions through the keyboard, just like President Obama. We have the keyboard to the left of the stage. And you can line up by the table to type your questions. Don't worry about spelling. I can read through typos. Don't apologize. We want people to accept us the way we are, rather than apologizing for being different. I would love to start to share your presentation with my colleagues and friends. Is it available online or otherwise so that I can share your wisdom and inspiration? What's your name? Haley. Haley Gorenberg. Great question, Haley. New York lawyer for public service interest. Can uh, we have a disability justice pr practice? Excellent. So we, we will need to ask pro bono now. I think the plan is to make, it, to make the video available. So you should be able to share it. I also just wrote a book that shares many of the stories that I shared tonight that you can also share with colleagues. And at the back of the book is a brief accessibility guide to help encourage people to start making changes right now to remove barriers. Thank you. Thank you deeply. Are there recent technologies that look very promising, like speech to text, image recognition, etc.? 
So many things that seem promising, but are also terrifying. For example, self-driving cars seem really exciting because it could increase mobility and freedom for people with disabilities. But I'm worried that the designers of the cars are not going to design for wheelchair users to independently operate the cars, or for blind people to independently operate the cars. So tech can open opportunities, but it can also create new barriers. We need accessibility and inclusion to evolve alongside technology so that as new opportunities come, they don't exclude people. Thank you. When you ask a question, start by introducing yourself. Hi, I'm Wendy. When you graduated from Harvard Law School, I'm sure you had so many options in front of you. Did you know going in that you wanted to be a disability advocate? I did. My personal statement for law school specifically said I wanted to develop the skills to create opportunities for people with disabilities. And when I graduated, I went into working at a law firm in Berkeley that does class actions on behalf of people with disabilities. I did that for about two and a half years. Litigation is one way to create change, but it's not the only way to create change. <laughs> so I left the firm to focus on training and education and writing. So now I do a combination of writing, speaking, and consulting to help remove barriers for people with disabilities. Thank you. Is there a technology product that doesn't exist now that you wish existed? I'm really excited about technologies that use haptics. Haptics is the communication of information through touch. And we're starting to see some of that, like watches and phones that have multiple vibration options to communicate different signals. But I want to see that advance. We can have a whole touch-based language that technology uses. And I want someone to develop something like that. That would be great. Thank you. <laughs> That was Jessica Stewart. My name is Jess. What, what suggestions do you have for law firms and legal service providers about how we can make pro bono opportunities more accessible to attorneys with disabilities. One place to start is in hiring practices. Let's increase hiring of people with disabilities. And a lot of attorneys with disabilities still face discrimination in the hiring process. Some attorneys develop disabilities later in life and become afraid to request accommodation because of a work culture that doesn't support people with disabilities and in a diverse culture. So let's make sure to remove all barriers in our cultures so that recruiters don't discriminate against attorneys with disabilities or paralegals with disabilities. 
We should have access in all aspects of the law firm. And the digital tools we use should be accessible. There should be programs for screen reading software. Videos we use in our firms should be accessible with captions. Thank you. Hi, Haven, it's Liz. <laughs> Were there any tools or resources you found very helpful at Harvard? And how did you like The Boston winters. <laughs> I did not like the Boston winters. They were really difficult for my dog. My dog needed to wear boots. My dog did not want to wear boots. So when we were walking along in the snow, they would deliberately drop the boots and not tell me. And students would come running after us saying, Maxine dropped her shoe. So the winters were tricky. The best part of Harvard Law School was really the community. There were people on staff to ensure that I had access. When I was applying for schools, I've encountered schools that were resistant to having me there and warned me that it would be very difficult. They did not have Braille services. They could not guarantee that I would get textbooks in Braille or exams in Braille. Whereas Harvard said, we haven't had a deafblind student at the law school, but let's figure it out. Let's make this work. And we engaged in an interactive process to find the solutions. It's OK if you don't know the answers, as long as you engage in the process to figure it out and find those solutions. Great question, Liz. Thank you. Okay, well, are there any other questions? Thank you. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Haben, for joining us today. It's been an honor to have you with us. So we'll take a quick break, five minutes, and we'll reconvene in five minutes for our next panel. Thank you.